So it was in 1755 that Euler wrote a book on differential calculus. Okay, and I'll just give you a brief idea of what that is. So differential calculus. Okay, and differential calculus deals mostly with rates of change. Okay, and a good example of this is something like speed, also known as velocity, and acceleration. Okay, both of these quantities deal with something changing, and in these cases is something changing with respect to time. Like for instance, speed is the distance you go compared to the amount of time it takes. Okay, and calculus is able to deal with certain things like this pretty well, much better than algebra can do it. Okay, in algebra, you always have to take an average over time, okay, because you always have some finite period of time you're talking about, okay, between one and two seconds, or between 1.56 seconds and 1.57 seconds. Okay, so you're always going to have some time range you're dealing with, but with calculus, you can shrink this time range to nothing, essentially nothing, okay? It's infinitely small. And then you'll have the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so it's really dealing with the instantaneous change. Okay, and it was the late 1760s when Euler added three volumes on something called the integral calculus. Okay, integral calculus. Okay, and this deals with more shapes. Okay, let's say I have some strange shape. Okay, and I want to know how much space does this thing take up? Okay, so we know how to find the area of very simple shapes like a rectangle or a square or even a circle. Okay, but how do you do it with such strange shapes with curves, essentially? Okay, these are no longer made up of straight lines. Okay, so the idea behind integral calculus is essentially to break these things up into really small little boxes that we can find the area of, or rectangles. Okay, and then we shrink these boxes down to almost nothing, the size of almost nothing, and then add them all up. Okay, and when you get to a calculus class, you'll usually see it done on the xy plane, where you'll have some curve, and you want to find the area underneath that curve. And so what you do is you break up this curve into lots of little rectangles. Okay, and then because these rectangles can essentially approximate the area underneath the curve. Okay, like if we were to zoom in, here's the curve, and then you'll have a rectangle that probably goes over a little bit, you know, so it's not exact. But when we shrink the size of these rectangles to nothing, okay, so we, we shrink them down to infinitely thin rectangles, then they approximate the curve perfectly. Okay, and then we could just add them all up, and that'll give us the entire area. Okay, and so that's what integral calculus deals with. And Euler wrote a considerable amount on calculus in general. Okay, so let's go back up to the timeline. Okay, and it was the 1760s when he wrote The Letters to a German Princess. Okay, and this was what is probably his most popular work because it summed up what he believed on a whole range of different scientific matters, not just mathematics and physics, but on basically anything, and it gave away a lot of his, his viewpoints on just life in general. Okay, so that's where we find out about his religious beliefs. And you could really consider Euler to be a popularizer, popularizer of science, okay? He made science interesting to the masses. Okay, Euler is a great teacher. He always liked to explain his reasoning so that you can kind of follow along and see what he did.
He'd show you what he was thinking, and then if that didn't work, he said, well, now I tried this, and he'd show you his reasoning there. And just, he kind of walked you along as he went. Okay, so he made science a lot more popular. And you could probably compare him to today's Neil deGrasse Tyson, or maybe Carl Sagan. So he did a lot to make science interesting for regular people. Okay, and it was in 1766 that he returns to the St. Petersburg Academy, but in that same year, he becomes blind in both eyes. Okay, and you might think that that's going to stop him, but it actually made him more productive than before, believe it or not. And I believe it was in the er some year in the early 70s, he was producing one mathematical paper every week. Okay, and he was completely blind when he was doing this. So what he would do is he would dictate whatever he visualized in his head and he would tell that information to either one of his children or to one of his servants or students. Okay, and it was Catherine the second who brought Euler back after many disagreements with Frederick the Great. Okay, and this time he's allowed to make his own contract, essentially and so he makes himself quite a generous one and even supplies jobs for some of his children. Okay, and unfortunately his return to Russia is kind of full of tragedy. Like I said, he becomes blind in both eyes. And in, I believe, the early 70s, his house burns down and he almost dies in the fire. And then in 1773, his wife, Katharina, dies. Okay, and then in 76, he decides to marry his wife's half-sister, okay, his deceased wife's half-sister, and her name is Salome Abigail Giselle. Okay, and she actually lives to 1794, so when Euler dies in 1783, she is still alive. And the story goes, when Euler dies, that he was discussing the newly found planet of Uranus with some friends or colleagues and then he had a stroke that afternoon and a couple hours later he dies. Okay, so that's the end of the great Leonard Euler.